what is light gauge steel? Um, light steel framing uses galvanized cold form steel sections as the primary structural components, which can be assembled as prefabricated panels. Now, if I quickly switch to my webcam, you'll be able to see some samples of light gauge steel. Can you see my, my camera now? Do you be able to see that we have? Yes, yes, we see. Yeah. Yeah. Be able to see that we have floor joists on something called a Z hanger. So it sits on top of the wall stuff and comes out underneath. We've got a floor board finish, a simple OSB. And we also have an example of the cementitious board with a fleece, literally like the fleeces you might wear as a coat or jumper lining. And this gives a particularly robust and very good acoustically, thermally, every definition floor construction. We'll touch on Lego and modular construction a little later, but we've also got a wall stud and a semi-typical build-up of a cementitious board on the outside for robustness, integrity, and also to stop rodent infestation. Rats particularly like to eat the wires and the pipes that go through the service holes, so if we put a board on, it acts as form of racking resistance to stop the building wobbling and it also stops the little critters getting in and then we have resilient bars which are an extra over and layers of plasterboard we can lose the resilient bar and put the plasterboard straight on the outside but then from the outside of the cementitious board we can have literally any finish this example is insulation mesh render and the top coat of render so it can be as simple as that or it can be masonry any rain screen etc it's very flexible in terms of finish and, and what it is i'll now switch back to the to the slides so some examples of of light gauge steel on on a construction site you can see the wrinkly tin metal decking. This particular deck is 15, one five millimetres or one and a half centimetres deep. It's a product called Lewis deck. And it has a total depth with a screed on top of it of five five millimetres. That's 55 millimetres roughly two inches for anybody that uses imperial measurements um and it, it does produce a particularly robust floor but it takes two or three days to go off so it slows down the production process whereas the cementitious board that we looked at a second or two ago you lay the chip board takes five minutes a sheet lay the cementitious board another two or three minutes a sheet done walk on it finished carpet it, whatever you want. The, the screed is slightly more robust, but takes three or four days to cure, so it slows down the erection process. You can see on screen some wall panels that are laid down ready for erection. You can see some examples of lintels, and you can also see some temporary bracing on the screen. So once it's fully erected and the walls are perpendicular to each other, etc. It's very robust. But while it's been erected, it does need some temporary bracing. So is this new? It's the practice is called MNC, Modern Methods of Construction, and light gauge steel is talked about as being a new technology. You're discussing it at university as part of the modern methods of construction, etc. But prefabrication was used for these examples. The, the, the picture is a, a grain store, but it looks very much like a module uh, or a modular building. It's on stilts, it's on uh, pad platforms, foundations. It has a side beam, it has floor joists, and it has pre-built walls. 
this was actually built this way to stop those lovely rats getting into the grain so they can't get over the mushrooms on top of the stones and raise up the floor again to stop that. It's from a, the 1700s and it's in a National Trust property in the south west of England. Um, but it's from 1700, so it's not new. Roman forts, very good example of history. They were modular, prefabricated. The Eiffel Tower, prefabricated, and post World War II housing. Prefabrication is the common factor. So it's not new. It's perceived as being new. Um, I've got to say, even for construction, the fact that the Romans in the 1700s were doing it, even that's pushing the boundaries of new for construction. But the Eiffel Tower and post World War II housing by construction standards is new. I often joke that if a, a Roman was to appear miraculously do some time travel work at Wormhole, they could start work on most construction sites now, straight away. No extra training, maybe a little bit of health and safety, but that'd be about it. Things haven't changed drastically. The Romans had concrete, they had survey, surveying levels, etc. It, it's not changed a lot construction. So it is a bit of a um, a battle, a bit of a struggle. I shouldn't use words like battle, it's too um, inflammatory, etc. Um, but it, it's resistant to change. So hopefully you guys and girls, your generation, you're going to help change that and show that we are not stuck in the mud as we seem to be. So a, a very brief history of off-site. Um, 18, apart from the examples we've shown earlier, but more recent history. In 1837, uh, um, this Henry Manning developed portable cottages for export to Australia from the UK. In 1889, the Eiffel Tower, a temporary structure. 1908, 75,000 homes. Now, considering what we're trying to do today, how many we're trying to build a year, this is you know quite impressive. Over a 30, 32 year period, and they had a catalogue of 400 house types. There are a couple of people, three or four or five, companies today that are not replicating, that's not the right word, but are repeating this sort of idea that they have come up with, or so we've gone full circle back to 1908, it's only taken 100 years, have been able to come up with a standardised kit of parts, standardised house design, standardised wall, wall panels, roof panels, etc., um, to, to try help solve the housing crisis and modernise construction and but as I say if a Roman turned up today they would fit in. There is a, a very strong mentality in construction not just in the UK but worldwide that if granddad did it that way it's good enough for me or great granddad even it's very very slow to change very conservative with small C. A little more up to date, 1996, IKEA, I'm sure you're all familiar with IKEA, and a Swedish construction company called Skanska teamed up to build the bow clock houses. They were at one stage available through the IKEA store. That's kind of fallen by the wayside a little, but they still exist. They're still something you can buy and build for, for self builds. 2001, I joined the industry. In 2010, in China, there was a 57-storey modular hotel built in just 19 days. I mean, that's impressive by anybody's standards. But to give you a, a little more context, um, a McDonald's drive through eatery, sorry, I refuse to call it restaurant, the typical time typical time from breaking grounds 
thing was turning up to dig the foundations, put services in, etc. To flip in a burger, first customer being served, is three days. The absolute record for this, for, for McDonald's to break ground to flipping a burger, was 24 hours. What you don't see is the uh, weeks or months in a factory somewhere putting the modules together. But for reduction in risk on site, for speed, last of disruption to the, to the local area, modular cannot be beaten. It has other reasons not to use it, which we'll discuss a little bit later, but it can be phenomenally fast. Ah, so let me remove this one now. Ilk Holmes, who recently spectacularly failed, not that far from me in Nairsborough, Flatsby is the next little village along, and um, started up. Ilk Holmes was a, a spin off from um, a modular builder, Elliot Modular, and a medium sized developer, Keepmo Homes. They decided there was a, a massive market for this, and I believe there is. I'm just not quite sure what happens with Elk, so cannot comment, but uh, that brings us up to date. So, what can Live Gauge Steel do? I'll now flash up a few examples. We've got a five story travel lodge in Clapham, I think this was. Those are old enough to remember the Olympic Stadium, or the Olympics in 2012 in London. These were some of the uh, concession stands. So you could buy fish and chips, food, t shirts, etc., around the outside of the main arena. Um, these were modular, so they could be taken away. A bit like walking in the countryside, the mentality was that we had to leave nothing but footprints. We couldn't even drill, mount, mark the um, the tarmac where these were sat. We couldn't hold them down. So to stop them blowing away, or theoretically blowing away in the one in 50 year wind event, we put water tanks in the floor to improve, increase the mass to give them more resistance and increase the friction. This is a panelized light gauge steel vertical extension um, from around 2010, becoming more and more popular now with recent legislative changes and expectations that people can extend vertically with the airspace development, etc. But this was one of the first one, first times this was done. Um, this house, believe it or not, albeit only a, a, a render, is built, is in Brazil, and is 90-95% light gauge steel. There are one or two fairly hefty hot roll beams in there for some of the cantilevers, but that's it. It was built by a company called Emicon, and it was their owner who now lives in this house, he had it built for himself. It's rather fantastic. Unfortunately, I haven't got any photos of the finished article. Um, we stopped working together because, well, to avoid tax, he was paying in cash by Western, Tra Western Union transfer. I, I wasn't happy doing that for some reason. But uh, this is a light gauge seal portal frame, although not a traditional portal frame as you, as you would expect with moment connections at the eaves and apex. This is a lattice truss or a scissor truss frame, so-called because it's narrow at the eaves and the, the apex and the base, like a pair of scissors at a point, and wider with the hinge-ish at the eaves. The whole structure is pin jointed, and you can just about see the plate of the connections. Some of these connections do need 10, 15, 20 fixings per end to, to carry the forces. Um, and while it's not ideal, 
from that viewpoint, there's a lot of labour in areas such as Mongolia, uh, out of Mongolia and the in the in the steppes, etc., or Afghanistan during that unfortunate war, where structures like this are needed and it's virtually impossible or extremely expensive to ship hot rolled steel sections out, whereas manufacturers seem to be able to ship a machine and some coil to, to roll. It's a solution that works and we've done several of these over the last 15, 20 years, so they do work. We also have this house in York. York is a smallish, medium-sized medieval city in the north of England. It was the capital of England under the Romans. And York, because of this historical past and its existing buildings, they have a requirement that buildings have to reflect the local buildings, the ones immediately around them to the extent that they have to have the same finish on the face of the building as the ones opposite to try and keep. So it can produce now some quite interesting and esoteric buildings with quite traditional faces on one side and extremely modern on the rear, etc. But this one was light gauge steel um, you, and then clad with replaying bricks. I mentioned at the very start with the light gauge steel on the render that we can put different finishes on there for the outside. This is another example. Um, the other little quirk with this, the frame went up so quickly, it took a week, 10 days, but the brickwork took uh, a month. So it, um, it rather embarrassed the bricklayers that uh, we were waiting for them on this, this particular job. But next we're going to move on to what what is used to design for? And I've, I've listed them out here, which you, you can all read you, on your, uh, your undergraduates or postgraduates. But we have the, the, the general self weight and imposed load. Um, I'm sure you all know what they are. We have to consider fire, wind, obviously, vibration, and acoustics are sort of interlinked in the acoustic sound is a form of vibration, isn't it? Um, sound waves. Once the sound gets into the extremely stiff structure, the light gauge seal structure, then like hitting the radiator and the hot water pipes, um, the sound will go from room to room to room. So what we do is we use the layers of plasterboard and the resilient bars and other techniques to stop the sound getting into the structure in the first place, because we make it so stiff. But because it is stiff and because it is lightweight, when it comes to floors, floors as in things we walk on as opposed to character floors, it's um, something we have to be very careful of and we'll consider in a moment. We have static, deflection checks and dynamic. There was a terrible case, a terrible maybe a little strong, there was a, an interesting great example case of Marines, English soldiers based in the Navy, who were renowned for being quite rough and tough, were feeling seasick, laid down in their beds on on, on the ground, you know, and, and on, on land, um, because the floor vibration was such that it made them feel seasick. Now, this is because humans are, we have the, in the inner ear, which tells you your balance, etc. If you, you're drunk and you're, that's when you, your brain gets mixed signals from the inner ear, etc. It's more sensitive to vibration when we're laid down. It's a very primeval thing, so that when we lived in caves, we'd be aware of danger approaching. But because of this, we're more sensitive to vibration. So when the floor was just vibrating at just the wrong frequency, the, these big burly marines were feeling seasick, laid on bed on land. Then the industry sat up, took notice and realised that it was this vibration. So now we designed for it so it, it can't happen again. There are other you know, reasons for doing it as well, but um, 
that was a, a vaguely comical, not so comical for the people involved. But uh, the other thing to think about are forces, obviously, as in any member, but buckling and moments. When you look at the light gate steel, the, the members are typically at 600 millimeter centers, vertically for the studs and horizontally for the joists. So they are ridiculously close together, but that's mainly because of the span of plasterboard and floorboards. But there's lots and lots and lots and lots of quite weak members compared to hot roll steel members that might be six meters apart, but are much more robust and much heavier. So the individual member capacity is quite low. It might be three kilonewton meters bending moment capacity compared to 3300 for hot roll steel members, but they're all carrying so much less load per member, it's not so much of a problem. But it's something that we need to be aware of. Generally, it's deflection limited because of this vibration or winds low deflection for the walls, but we do need to be aware of um, the low-ish strength capacities of these profiles, which we'll discuss a little bit later. later. And coming on to the deflection and back to the strength is the height or span. Um, when we calculate deflection, the formula is W L cubed E over E I. E Young's modulus, I being the surface of the profile, W being the, the load, L the length cubed. So length has three times the effect of everything else. It's just worth remembering when you're uh, looking at such things. So you quickly look at the example of the floor and general construction build-up. This can be found in a guidebook called by the a group called the SCI, the Steel Construction Institute. There was a design guide called P402, which is available for about £30 of, of a copy, albeit a PDF, rather than a hard copy. Um, and it's, but it's full of plain English and fantastic illustrations to illustrate how it works. But we need to consider self whitening pose loads. These are typically the floor finish. And we'll come on to this in a second. The ceiling finish, as you see, the, the ceiling board being highlighted. And the use. So typically, use wise, a domestic floor would have a, an appliance load of one and a half kilonewtons per square meter for people and then we'd allow a little extra for partitions etc internal walls just because because we're engineers and we like to be extra safe whereas a dance studio or a nightclub or with people jumping up and down and bouncing we will look at five six kilonewtons. Um, a lecture theatre like you're in now might be three to four kilonewtons for the imposed loads. So this is why we need to consider the use of the building, not just the floor finishes and what it's made from. Here is an extract from P402 again. But we also have, um, which I will share, the uh, readily available. We have some enhanced versions of these tables that we generated with the SCI's permission. So rather than just discussing the what the floor buildup is and the um, acoustic rating and the fire rating, there's two columns for acoustic rating. One's for airborne sound and one's for impact sound, which are subtly different, if anybody knows anything much about acoustics. And the fire ratings are very indicative, but, you know, quite reasonable. Although they are a bit of a, excuse the pun, hot topic at the moment. But um, we've also included the self-weight 
in our tables because that's obviously quite important. And the floor type. We talked about deflection. And we'll touch on it again in a few minutes. Um, but the different floor boards affect how we calculate the deflection. And the different floor buildups affect how we calculate the deflection. The floor buildup affects the weight. Um, the fire requirement affects the weight, affects the performance. The acoustics, the speed of construction, because that is an important factor. Are we looking at uh, three days to produce a um, McDonald's drive through, or are we looking at two weeks to produce a house? And is the construction modular or panelized? If it's modular, is it just the floor finish and then a separate ceiling? Because that's how the modules go together. If it's panelized, is it is the floor just carrying the floor load and the ceiling load? So it's all just things to be aware of. None of it's scary, none of it's difficult. It's just questions to ask when you're designing a floor. What's the finish? What's it to do with? What is it being? So I've mentioned a couple of times now that we have floor design deflection is the problem or are problems we're aware of. So I say we have four deflection criteria. Two are static. So we check it on the static dead loads. Um, general imposed loads of the one and a half, three, etc. And then we also have two dynamic checks. So we're, we're checking how the, the frequency of vibration, which are principally for the for the feel, which I know is a bit woolly, a little bit um, not what you thought it's what the engineers will be talking about, all touchy feely type things. But it is very, very important. When people walk into one of our buildings, this, you will be designing buildings in a very short time, and you will, like me, I'm sure, it's your building. Don't matter who's paid for it, whose money it is, it's your building. That's just the way we engineers seem to feel about things. Um, so you, you want to be proud of it and young people to, to think what a lovely building, what a great space. Not, oh, I've got to make allowances for this or oh, that feels wrong or it just wants to be, you want them to be feeling great in there and looking at the aesthetic of it, etc. Not what we've done. Which is a little weird, a little counterintuitive, since we're so proud of our buildings, but that's what we want. We want to blend into the background. We don't want people to be thinking of us. That's our superpower. Strength is rarely a factor in like a steel joist design. The boards on top provide complete restraint to stop it buckling and twisting, so we treat it fully restrained. So that's one thing, but it's the deflection, this feel, the the the, the liveliness of the of the floor. Because it's so lightweight, um, a typical 18 mil chipboard on this choice is 0.2 kilonewton per square meter, or I think that's about 20 kilograms per square meter. Coming down to the composite steel decking with a concrete slab, we're jumping up to 0.75, so 75 kilograms per square meter. Compared to concrete slabs of three and four, which is 300 and 400 kilograms a square meter, we're tiny, inconsequential almost, which is great because it means smaller, lighter foundations, which means it's greener, it's more environmentally friendly, more sustainable, blah, 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 blah. But it's easier to get it moving, it's easier to get it excited. Is the phrase we use, isn't it, for vibration? There's less mass 
needed less energy to, to get it moving. But once it moves, it stops very quickly. Um, again, the flip side too. So we're going a little more into the static and dynamic deflection criteria here. We designed for the single joist, and this is important when we come on to the dynamic things in a minute. A single joist so which then imposed loads span over 350 or 15 millimeters as an absolute limit. And then we also check the deflection under the imposed load only, a span of a 450. These are all tabulated in um, industry guidance like P402 and NHBC, one of the warranty companies have some guidance and proprietary software will do this for you. Dynamic deflection, and this is where it gets a little more worthy to talk about the frequency should be less than 8 hertz, so we don't feel it. It's dead load plus 20% of the imposed load. This is achieved by limiting the deflection of a single joist to less than 5 millimeters. And then we also check the deflection of the complete floor, a series of joists plus the flooring material, so it's a 1 kilonewton point load. Now, what this means is that looking at the joist centres, 400 or 600, and what type of floor it is in this floor configuration description, which is the, one of the missing columns that we've enhanced. So we define this one as a chipboard floor. This, from memory, is a cement particle board floor. And this is a built up acoustic floor. Now, what that then means is that this one kilonewton point load that we apply to the one joist can be shared over two and a half or 2.35 joists or three or etc. So that we're quantifying the effect that this board has some or these floor finishes have some stiffness so that the joists cannot move in isolation. They are part of a system, is what, it, what it's acknowledging. It, it's based on test data, empirical test data from Milwaukee Institute of Technology, I think it was, or some quite, it sounded quite random to me, I was sort of uh, from a TV show rather than scientific bed, hotbed. Um, anyway, that's beside the point. We then um, limit the deflections based on bands to ridiculously small limits, 1.7 to 1.2 millimetres of deflection under this one kilonewton point load. That then brings us to the 8 hertz frequency. It's not difficult to do, it's not onerous, it's just this is how we do it and that then limits the feel of what we want. It has to be said that you still can get some issues around this, but that's because as ever, manufacturers looked at it and said, oh, that's a bit tight, that's a bit hard, we can't do that, so they ask for some wiggle room in there when, when it was all written because people pay for the for the research and the researchers do what the paymasters want. Um, it's just a sad fact of humanity. So don't design your joist to 99.9% .9 capacity on these deflection criteria is all I'm trying to say there. So floor joists are deemed to be fully restrained by the finishes with one caveat that we fasten the floorboard down Properly, and by properly, I mean in accordance with the information here. 230 millimetres in the centre. You can see the diagram, you can see the red. So in the middle of the board, not at the edges, two, every 230 centimetres, 230 millimetres, sorry. Not centimetres, that's quite a big difference. 
and 150 millimeters at the edges. I challenge anybody to go to a site and find where they've done this. Because if you mention this to any erector, the obviously stupid, I'm not doing that, it's far too close, but this is what it needs to be. One of the joys of factory control, factory, modular, etc., pre panelized floors is that we can do this. And if we use any form of automation, again, it can be done much more easily. Um, so there are solutions to this. And if you're the engineer going out inspecting and getting the abuse from the, or the comments and etc. from the erectors, you've got a definitive guide to be able to refer them back to. Not so much this presentation, although feel free to, but it's in industry guidance like P402 and the NHBC guidance. The strength to weight ratio of light to steel joists is higher than that of timber joists. So they're advantageous there. Subtle thing that we, we don't want to be shouting about again though, is this, the mass. Because the strength to weight, etc. The timber joists are marginally heavier, so they've got slightly more mass going back to the vibration, etc. It's just something to be wary of the people discussing it with you. But steel joists are dry stable and do not suffer the long term problems of drying out, such as creep or shrinkage. When somebody we would erect a timber framed building, a little shouted about fact, but acknowledged widely in the industry, the timber industry, you would on a two or three story house, you'd have to allow 20, 30 millimeters of shrinkage in the window frames. So you make them 20, 30 millimeters bigger so that when it's fully loaded up with the self weight, with the roof tile, etc., the frame will shrink 30 millimeters almost immediately. With light gauge steel, it comes out the factory, comes out the machine at 2.5 meters high. 200 years later, it's 2.5 meters high. It's not changed. So steel joists are dry, stable, and they're not suffering long term shrinkage problems. And I've highlighted before, I'm saying it again. Joists are generally positioned at 400 or 600 millimeter centers. Um, this is to do with the uh, the floor finishes, etc. I'm sure Professor will uh, share these notes with everybody else, but if he isn't able to, I'm happy to, if people want copies of all this, I'll, I'll start flying through things a little more shortly. We've been an hour already. This is again an extract from P402. It's got some great examples of the details that we need to consider and the, the way the system works together. You can see, for example, the corking at the edge of the floorboard, the way that the floorboard runs over and the wall boards come through. This is all the detail, the, the acoustics and the fire topping and thermal values. We've got fire socks in the cavities. Um, fire stock, stocks, stops, and the vertical cavities. We've got brick ties on channels. We've got insulation between the party walls so we keep the acoustics down so people aren't hearing TVs and live music from the uh, lovely neighbours next door, etc. So it's all these things to be to be thinking about. It, it's a system. You're not designing just the joist. You're not designing just the wall. You're not designing just the masonry. It's everything together. So you need to work closely with the other professionals, the architects, the acousticians, the fire engineers, the services, the m &E people. Um, one of the advantages of light gauge steel is it does come pre-manufactured with the service holes and things comes in, and we can do deeper lattice trusses or deeper joists with big holes in, as long as they're suitably reinforced, etc. So we can coordinate with the services team. Um, 
well, that's the point I want you to walk away or take away from this, that we're working together with other professionals. So for walls, we're looking at the effective length, how high it is, how much twist the lateral torsion or buckling. Is the force eccentric? I'll just go back. With this floor joist, we can see here on a Z hanger, it's not on top of the wall, it's actually on the face of the wall. So the reaction is at least half the depth of the stud away, which is an additional bending moment that we haven't considered if we're not careful. We've got the noggins. Noggins is a English constructional word for horizontal members that are designed to prevent vertical twist. If you take a long slender object, it's like a 30 centimetre ruler, hold it either end and push down and squash it, it won't just bow along its length, it will try to twist along its length as well. The, if you shorten the length by holding it halfway down, it's much stronger, much stiffer, much stockier. So this is what the, the noggins are there for, to reduce the effective length and make it a stocky profile. But is it better to put a noggin in or to go to a thicker stud? Can you go to a thicker stud? Can your machine, your client do that, etc.? So there's these considerations, as well as fire, acoustics, speed of construction, speed of manufacture, and is it modular or panelized? Um, the, the top example is a very, very basic wall with plastic on the inside and panelized construction. The bottom one is a party wall, but could equally be or is typical of modular construction because you've got walls on either side of the module, each module. If it was a hotel, for example, you don't have a wall and then nothing. It's got, it's normally normal to have walls on both modules. But then that means that both walls are only carrying half the load or the load from their side. Whereas in the panelized construction, the wall could be carrying the load from both walls on either side of the wall. So it's just things to, to be aware of and to think about. I mentioned proprietary software. I also have a, a software business that came out of like a steel. So this is an example of some of the software that we sell. It designs the business standards with the euro codes, etc. Database of profiles. My, my point of showing it today is we can put the stud height in. Um, it then accounts for the effective length. We've got the noggins versus the gauge. So number of noggins, or we can change the gauge. On the next screen of this, which we don't show in the presentation, but it tells you the self weight. So it's calculating which is heavier per linear meter to go up a gauge or to put noggins in or to close the stud centers rather than I think this is the best way of doing it. We, we thought it was better and easier for, for users to know that. But it prompts you to put in the roof load, the floor load, number of floors, self weight of the wall, um, finishes, etc., and the wind load and the deflection limits. Now, the wind load is the big horizontal force for this stud, which causes the deflection, which we talked about is a problem. So it's important that we calculate the wind load accurately. I don't just mean to a standard. You go to the wind maps, it looks like what contour lines on and shows basic wind speeds across the country. And that's great, but it's quite crude. It's better if we can to get accurate wind speed information for the specific site location on when it comes to light gauge steel, because it can be such a critical factor to the design, to the to stud deflection. Speaking of stud deflection, um, there are tips and tricks around the deflection limits. 
we stick to 360 or default to 360 so that we don't um, crack the plasterboard. You might be able to get away with item 250 for more flexible finishes, or you might need to go up to height of a 500 for really brittle finishes. With a masonry skin, it's arguable that you can apply height of a 500 for the deflection limit, but then half the wind load because both skins take half the load each, and, and then act as a sort of lattice truss for the book ties, etc. But these are subtle nuances we've not really going to have time to cover today. So when we run the member checks, the calculations, these are what it looks like. We've got compression, flexural buckling, buckling resistance, um, local capacity checks, and overall buckling checks. So you can see the four runners. Um, they're all, this is from BS5950 part five. So now a, a brief discussion on modular or panelized. I've touched on it a few times. The drivers, I mean, the principal driver is, are you working for a modular builder or are you working for a panelized builder? Hopefully you're at one of the bigger consultancies and you're doing the very high level scheme design. So you'll maybe want to consider both options of modular or panelized at, at that stage. So things to think about are uh, the speed on site, McDonald's, this is a student accommodation in Dublin. The whole build on site was done in around two months, but the whole project was near nine months because it took time to build the modules in the factory. But then they get built, finished, covered up like this for, for well, the protection because this is one of the other considerations because the modules of student accommodation in this case was fully finished carpeted beds in duvets on the lot fully finished first person to the door had paid the two grand the term or whatever it is for accommodation nobody on site needs to go in those in those rooms when they got the site so you've got to make sure they're, they're fully weather protected uh, it was about this time of year from these photos were taken. Um, another issue can be access, panelized construction, or even stick built. If we want to go that extreme, we can need much less, um, much smaller areas to get in. If you're trying to lift a module in, you've got to have a crane, you've got to be able to physically get the lorry and the module to a point where you can lift it up, etc. So access, transport, etc. are drivers. That's not drivers as in driving the vehicle, but what are the drivers for the project? Is it bish bash bosh? You want to get it done on site quickly, quietly, with minimal disruption to the surrounding area, or cost? And there's quite a few other things to consider. Lifting modules. There are, as I say, as many solutions as there are manufacturers, and every manufacturer of modules will tell you that theirs is the best system. Personally, I haven't seen one system that does absolutely everything. One might be brilliant at, at the actual lifting, but a devil to put two modules together. One might be brilliant to put the modules together, but fastening them together then, once you've lifted them, might be a bit of a finger trap. So people are trying to put, there's a risk for people wanting to put their hands in holes and our fingers sheared off as, which I know is not a pleasant thought, but that's why we're discussing it. Local regulations, the, how we lift things and the regulations around lifting straps and testing and safety and all very, important but it's something to consider when you've got to have tested straps and certified straps you've got to know where they are and keep track of them and they've got to be tested every so many lifts etc or do we use temporary lifting points that are one use we over engineer it slightly 
well then we can cut it off and we don't need to worry about tracking it, tracing it, etc. The connectivity, module to module. How do we fasten the modules together while we're lifting it and etc. And weather resistance, which as I say, the student accommodation was done this time of year. And you can see from the photos, it's quite a clean and tidy site. Yes, it's a bit wet and muddy, but that's not the construction's fault particularly. But there's not piles of rubbish everywhere. There are two skips that are barely used and a weed bin. That's sort of the levels of rubbish that they've got from doing modular. There's little to do on site. Um, just have a look at the sketch a second and I'll. Uh, Today we really should be using 3D BIM and CAD, but I'm a little old school um, and I'm infamous in the industry for my felt tip sketches. I do need to get better at them at uh, CAD and BIM, but uh, the illustration still stands on the points. Is it platform or balloon construction that we're looking at? The examples I've shown you so so far have been balloon construction, the second one. Platform is where the joists, the, the green members here, will be sat on top of the red wall stud and then the next wall stud on top. And that's fantastic, that's brilliant. But on a five story building, the ground floor joists are then carrying the reaction from all floor all four floors above. So we have to then check the end of the joist that would be trapped in between the walls to make sure it's not being crushed, which isn't particularly difficult. And if it's found to be failing, there are simple solutions like putting another piece of wall stud against the joist so that the joist isn't actually carrying the load. It's another piece of wall stud which is proven to be able to carry it. But it's then how you build it, um, as in the order of putting it together, etc. And different levels for stairs, windows, half landings, etc. Or, or with the platform construction, I, mean, I don't know why they call them platform balloon this way around. It, to me, though, it should be the other way around. Platform should be balloon, the balloon should be platform. But um, that's been the point. The floor sits on the walls in platform construction. No, I've got that. Yeah, anyway. Um, with it being inside, as in the sketch, we've got to, we don't have the, the localised crushing, but we do have to make sure we have sufficient strength to carry the reaction from the floor joist. Now, when you look at this Z, if we just put a load on the end on this Z without this fixing, reasonably the stress at the heel would be sufficient that we would straighten the Z out and it would just become an L, upside down L, and the joist would fall down. So if we put sufficient fixings in and each one of these little tech screws five mil down the tech screw will carry um five kilonewtons which is from early conversations about 50 kilograms so that's one tech screw if we put that one in though the fixings got to fail before the Z can straighten out. So if we put sufficient fixings in, the Z cannot straighten out. And it can't bounce if it's fitted together snugly. If there's a gap between the um between the red stud and the green red stud and the green joist, then you will get some bounce, some spring in this joint here 
and potentially it straightening out and dropping and reforming itself. So it's great for us in our ivory towers of universities and design offices to, to sketch this up and say this works. But on site, we have to make sure that this detail is followed. That it is robustly fastened together. Properly on site. Um, I've been involved in after the event as a expert witness afterwards, two buildings that had partial collapses. In both cases, it was due to a lack of fixings because for whatever reason, installers didn't put the fixings in and then the Z straightened out. One took out three floors, one was a scissor thrust portal frame and uh, there was a partial collapse, it only drops only, drops about 50 cent, uh, 50 millimetres, but um, that's not the point. It shouldn't have moved if there'd been the fixings in. So it is supremely important and, and something that we do need to, to think about. It's not just an engineer being pedantic or worrying or wittering. It is a real concern if people don't follow the instructions. So something just to be aware of when you're looking at these things. We'll briefly move on to some design examples. Um, we've got about 20 minutes left and then I'm hoping to have a question and answer session at, at, at the end. That's OK with everybody. So we're going to briefly go into more detail about the, the design, the, the sort of checks that we do. So wind, the factors that affect the wind load are the location where it is in, in the country. Is it relation to town? Is it in country? Is it by a big piece of water, by the coast, etc.? The height of the building, basic wind speed, all of which affects the wind pressure. And then as you get more into the wind analysis, there's localised coefficients and the in different zones, the ABC, the 10% for the, for the corner, 20% and the rest of the building and then it reverses. And there's also the overall load. So while we've got the individual zones for cladding, etc., we do also need to think about the overall load, trying to push the building over, etc. Horizontal members. Is it a roof or a floor? If it's a roof, it's very much like a wall. We're looking at Spanner 360, Spanner 500, 250. <clears throat> Pure imposed deflection limits, really. Is it a, a, solid, a solid seat, as we looked at at the very start of the lecture, or is it a lattice truss? Um, lattice trusses are fantastic, are very flexible in terms of design, not flexible in performance, as in the, they're not bouncy, but they are slow and difficult and expensive to assemble. So some manufacturers shy away from them. But if you only got certain profiles like an 89 or 100 mil deep C section and you want to span eight meters, there's no way that a single C will do that. So you need to think about lattices, which is effectively a, a lattice girder with the sections spaced apart over a certain depth. And then we go on to the to the load, the self-weight, the imposed loads, et cetera. Think about those deflection checks. They are very important, especially the dynamic ones. And as we've just touched on, the ultimate limit state checks and fixings. Ultimate limit state strength checks are, can I say, are generally not the issue, the, the problem, the, the, the Achilles heel to this. The fixings can be. They're not difficult, they're not onerous, but they are something that can be the failure point and we need to be aware of. And then tied into that is the, is the reactions. Reactions for the fixings, but also reactions to the supporting structure, to the foundations, to the building. And one of the many advantages of light gauge steel 
is its lightweight and low reaction forces and smaller foundations. Studs, we need to remember to account for the roof and the floor load, if appropriate. It might be that the roof spans in one direction and the floor perpendicular to it, so the two aren't combined. <coughs> what centres, what stud centres, when we come onto lintels and doors and things like that, that can have quite an effect. The number of floors, the wind blows, and the deflection checks, and then finally the um, the foundation loads. Again, in our software, it states the service limit state loads for the dead and imposed and combined in the calculation, so that they're there ready to be marked onto the foundation loads. And we also check them in the ultimate limit state as well for the probabilities reasoning of the members. But uh, it's fine to think about how we will use it if we're doing the whole job, or how our colleagues doing the groundworks might require the information. Something that's not too widely considered or worried about, at least, in light gauge steel is progressive collapse. It's not too worried about or too commonly discussed, principally because light gauge steel is generally used for up to three story buildings. Um, just because that's where people are comfortable. No other reason than that. And below, at three stories and below, even under the new Building Safety Act, it's not too onerous, the progressive collapse requirements. Coupled with the fact that there are so many fixings, fastening the joists to the walls and fastening the walls together, laterally, side to side, etc. Um, these things are near impossible to pull down. The, the point of light gauge steel and progressive collapse is that we consider if one wall was to, to vanish in an explosion, aliens disintegrated the wall, would the floor stay up to a reasonable definition of up? Um, it's not allowed to collapse or to collapse rapidly. You can slowly collapse, giving people time to escape slowly. Again, because of the fixings from the floorboards into the joists, providing restraint, this Z hanger that we tend to use, the top track to the wall, etc. It's all tied together so well that it isn't a a major problem. There have been um, examples of people who've built exhibition stands, two story exhibition stands, etc., and for whatever reason, not the most environmentally friendly, want to just take it down and go home at the end of the exhibition. So they literally pulled walls off, um, pulled the roofs off, and just hopes it'll then collapse in on itself, and it doesn't. So they're not the most scientific of tests, but we've semi-proven the maths, and it's because of details like these tiny plates and these Zs um, that are inherently there in the way we construct a light gauge steel building that progressive collapse becomes less of a problem in reality, not just in theory. For a traditional well, hot rolled steel building, the tying forces are in the region of 75 kilonewtons. For a cold formed light gauge steel building, the tie forces between the floor joists and the wall, etc., and wall to wall are 15.15, so dramatically smaller. Couple that with the fact that a screw has a capacity of five kilonewtons. Um, it's not difficult or not impossible to see that um, there will be three victims in, in those connections anyway, by default. Um, so it, it, it 
it just works. It's easy to calculate. And again, the software does it for, for, as, as an aside, but it's not something that you'll be asked to look at on a great deal of times. Um, for me personally, it's more of a concern, consideration to think about acid fire protection and the acoustics and etc. There are things that you maybe should be more aware of than um, worrying about progressive collapse. Be aware of it, we don't need to worry about it too much. Openings in walls, we're talking lintels, etc. here. Generally, if you have studs at 600 centres or joists at 600 centres, we can easily, readily demonstrate that if you take the take two studs and move them out to create a 1800 opening or nominal 1800 central lamp center line, so it'd be slightly less than the flange width, each stud joist member is carrying the same load as it was before. How we distribute that trimmers, lintels, etc., is another story, but it's a good rule of thumb that as long as you do that and then have studs at 600 centers and then do the 1800 opening again so that we're not cheating the system we're not bringing more load into the equation than we were originally it, it's nice and simple from that viewpoint then moving on to the the lintel or the trimmer we need to think about the loads that are applied vertically for wall openings and the horizontal from the wind load, etc. And this is where we can get a little bit not tricky, but more interesting, shall we say, for a given volume of interest in any way. Lattice trusses are great as lintels to carry the vertical load. But then the bottom cord is an inverted C in the weak axis, um, which is incredibly weak. So when it comes to the lateral load over bigger spans, they can be not so good. Whereas the compound C sections, um, which will be two back to back and then two on top, have strength in both directions, but not as much vertical strength as a lattice truss just due to geometry. So one happy medium way of dealing with that is to form a lattice truss with a compound bottom cord, which gives you the best of both worlds. You've got the vertical capacity and some horizontal capacity. And failing that, then we have to revert to hot roll steel profiles, box sections, for the bottom cord or screwed to the bottom cord of a lattice truss, etc., to give us that additional lateral wind resistance. Um, again, it's a real problem, not just a pretend engineer being concerned about it problem. We normally talk about windows or glazed doors, and glass has a particularly good way of sticking two fingers up at you and saying, no, you may have well have made the numbers dance and said that it works, but if the deflection's too much, it cracks. So you've got to be careful and sensible and not, oh, that'll be right, because you can just about guarantee it won't. There was one job I designed called the Cus um, Rhubarb Building, opposite the custard factory, which um, rhubarb custard is a vaguely traditional English pudding. Quite nice, the bitterness and the sweetness, but uh, some of the idea of a joke, I think, calling rhubarb opposite the custard factory in Birmingham. But they used lattice trusses for the lintels and um, decided that they wanted to make them shallower because of the head requirements, didn't tell us, built it that way, and then um, the windows cracked. 
it's it just vertical, the, the, the loads and the floors are all on the same job. However, they dumped a, a three ton coil of metal on the floor they're using for strapping for some unknown reason. And that may have had something to do with the crocking because they overloaded the floors. It wasn't designed for three tons point load applied to it. This is about 30 kilonewtons. So not the one kilonewton we were talking about in the designs of it, but that's something else. Racking. This is a, a name for the parallelogram and stop the, the building falling over like a pack of cards. We need to know the building dimensions, the wind load, so we can calculate the, the horizontal overall load. Look at the stud height and profile, and whether it's K bracing, X bracing, which is as it sounds, straps of steel in an X formation, formation or the sheathing. K bracing, again, looks a little like the K, but it, think of it as a lattice truss, but vertically in the wall, so diagonals in between studs. That's, I mean, the best, as in the most efficient, in terms of mathematically efficient, but also um, in terms of production, manufacture and erection efficient. X bracing, I have traditionally, um, until a week ago, would have said, no, nope, not on my watch. It doesn't work. It's not possible to get it taut enough, enough tension. Um, by the time it's parallelograms enough to create the tension, um, the parallelogram, the, the, the lateral movement is so much so great that we've got into second order effects along the crit sway check. So it's failed. Mathematically, yeah, it's, it's great. But in reality, you can't get it taught enough. Then I found them um, just last week, a company called Frame Cadmium Machines who have developed a solution that looks like a, a U with a thread in. You fasten to the back of the strap, tighten it up, and um, it's as tight as a guitar string. There's no slack whatsoever, and if you over tighten it, you can actually pull the frame out of square. So that's a solution. Um, or another solution is sheathing. The, the, the boards, the cementitious board that we, we mentioned earlier on the outside. This is the way that, sorry for the foul language, timber frame would provide the racking resistance. And so it definitely works, well-proven technology. However, mathematically, by testing and everything else, K bracing needs less wall, less length of wall to resist the horizontal forces than sheathing, unless we're talking about putting a skin of metal over um, rather than OSB or some antithesis board. But then we get back to the environmental sustainability and it not quite as good as it could be, is it? Um, X bracing, in theory, and using this proprietary tensioner, is possibly the best solution. K bracing has issues with the uplift, which we mentioned at the bottom here. For every four and a half kilonewtons applied horizontally per bay, per set of 600 mil studs, we get a massive uplift of 24, 25 kilonewtons uplift, which is two and a half tons, which is, is not massive. Um, a 10 mil bolt, possibly even an 8 mil bolt resin anchor is sufficient to, to resist that uplift. It's just um, having the foundation then that's big enough. If it's a com mass concrete foundation, if it's a screw pile, if it's strip foundations, probably all well and good. If we're only starting using beam and block foundations and things like that, 
that then the individual block that you're fastening to has to weigh more than two and a half tons. It just doesn't happen. A, a typical breeze block is 20 kilograms, if that. Uh, it, the loads are so, so it, it's just something else to be thinking about. This system is not the individual bits that we're talking about, it's the whole. Um, again, if anybody's got any questions, any points that want clarifying now or after, feel free to uh, to drop me a line, shout, WhatsApp, whatever is easiest for you all. Fire is a pet bugbear of mine. The existing standards and the existing capacities of the test rigs at the BRE, Exova, Effectus, the other test houses, are sufficient to test roughly three-storey buildings of any material. Not this is not limited to large steel, but the the capacity of the rigs is such that based on normal three, four, five meter wide rooms. The rigs can only apply sufficient load to be equivalent to three stories. If we're talking concrete floors, etc., then we're down to one story of capacity. And that's, you know, is what it is. But the testing standard, this is if you like gauge steel, but the testing standard says. In the design case, you cannot apply more load to the members than you applied in the test case or the test becomes invalid. So we're limited to the test capacity, the rig capacity, and that's not good when we're trying to do 10 storey, 7 storey hotels, etc., like the one in Platinum, Travelodge. So for five or six years, I've been working with people like Professor and others at um, other universities to come up with solutions to this, mathematical ways of calculating our testing. Um, just a couple of days ago, launched, announced this, discussed this with the trade body for like HCL, so we're, we're trying to move it forward. I've also got two or three fire engineers on board to help who agree with the principles and that we can calculate and um, we're not talking desktop studies, desktop assessments or any other fudgery. It's all pure calculation. There are two standards, one to the BS, one to the Eurocode, so that we can calculate the capacity of the studs when they're hot. Um, effectively, we just reduce the yield strength. And recalculate the section properties and then reduce the load factors and blah, blah, blah. So we can sort all that out. Um, we do want to rely on some element of testing, albeit it can be non load burning tests, etc., for board failure. We could calculate the U value, the thermal conductivity of boards, and then say this is how long it takes the stud to get hot. But I believe it would be better, safer, slightly more cautious that we use tested data for this. So that if the boards fail during the test and the calculation might not account for that, or the fixings, etc., and localize things, is it realistic? So we take some element of tested data and apply this to the theoretical model and then validate that. With the fire engineers and their FEA analysis, etc. So we're coming up with new solutions all the time. Well, that's one of the reasons I'm here today, because we are cutting edge is probably a bit strong, but I am interested in trying to raise standards and make things better, which sounds all very altruistic and I suppose is slightly, but uh, I am trying to make a living at this as well. Acoustics. Um, we have stiff studs, stiff joists, stiff members, and stiff is really good at transmitting sound. 
So we have to be wary of that. We can use various soundboards, various build-ups of finishes to prevent the sound getting into the studs, which is what I touched on at the start. We can also use things like the resilient bars that I showed you, and they are in a lab fantastic, absolutely brilliant. But on site, it's too easy for installers, erectors to, when I say bypass the resilient bar, put the fixings in so it's, they go through the boards through the resilient bar and into the stud, therefore bypassing the resilient bar and transmitting the sound. So then when somebody tests it on site, which is a requirement of the building regulations, we've got failures. And it's very, very, very difficult to identify where the failure is. So although they are fantastic, when done properly, we do need to be extremely careful um, when installing them. So just, again, something to bear in mind when you're out and about in your role as engineers, inspecting things on site.